People once believed that when someone dies, a crow carries their soul to the land of the dead. But sometimes, something so bad happens that a terrible sadness is carried with it, and the soul can't rest. Then sometimes, just sometimes, the crow could bring that soul back to put the wrong things right. I hate to say it, because she's probably a very nice little girl. And now she's about our age, I'm sure. <laughs> it's like she's 40, probably. I know it's a small part. But can't we do a little better than this? <laughs> Am I, I right? You know, I mean, I, I right? guess I've seen this movie 300 times, so when I watch it, it's just like, it is what it is. But I think you're coming at it from a, different, from a fresher perspective, and I can't say you're wrong. Like, I'm I, sorry. I can't say you're wrong. I don't need to knock the kid, but... She wasn't very good in this movie, was she? <laughs> does, does it get you, though, that it, like, basically... Do you feel like they're talking down to you by explaining the plot of the movie in the first one minute, or do you feel like that's good movie-making because they're just getting to the point? No, I'm, I like it, and I think it's very 90s, 80s-slash-90s of movies to do that, and I'm all for it. The opening I'm narration? Okay. Yeah, I'm okay with that. And I, I like the little miniature set that they used, too, where the, it was obviously a little camera flying over, like, miniature sets while she's talking. Yeah. But I like that too. I'm a fan. But I, I, I agree with you. Not very good. But as oh we God. say on all these episodes, she's the vessel. She's the vessel by she's which you vessel. experience yeah. the, the movie. Yes, yes so, she is. <laughs> I, so I, look, I don't know if you know this, but this is episode 150 of the Last Row podcast. 150? Like officially, right? But like we've done more, I think. No, we've done less. Should we have done a different movie for, for 150? No, like, no. 150 is not a real number, Drew. Should we have like, done a celebration? 150 is not. That's a fake celebration number. Like 150th anniversary. Like, what is that? <laughs> should we do an anniversary for 175th episode? Maybe. 100, Maybe 125th episode? It's just a round number. I think if you look at literal numbers, like, we have more than no. 150 because we did, you know, on demands and weird things. Those, but those, aren't, real, those aren't real shows. I, but, If you asked me three years ago, I don't know if we'd ever got to 150. So here we are. Yeah. So at least well, like, there's that. Yeah. 200. Talk to me when we get, if and when we get okay. to 200. That's 200. A real, that's a real anniversary. We'll bust out the, the champagne over Whatever. there and, and do it. So anyway, if you are new to the show, check our website out, thelastrowpodcast.com, or if you just want to check out our website, follow us on all of the social media channels, X, Instagram, Facebook, at The Last Row Pod. Consider subscribing on Spotify, YouTube, Apple Podcasts, and leave us a five-star review if you're enjoying the show. 1994 back in the time machine bad way if the people are new to the show they turn it off after the two minutes of rambling about nothing probably so we just lost them <laughs> probably the crow may 11th 1994 big time crow fan you eh? maybe not in 94 but i you, i had the you. vhs i'm pretty sure i bought it from suncoast video and you, i did watch this in the 90s you crow head you look crow i head. like the crow <laughs> You like the crow? You sure you like about the that? crow? You sure you crow guy? <laughs> Runtime one hour forty two minutes. Just right. Action slash fantasy. Yeah, just about right. I was I was ready for it to end. <laughs> no, this, they could have easily made this a two and a half hour movie, like with ar- artsy fartsy. And yeah, this and that, and I'm brooding all over the place. I'm glad they didn't. Uh, directed by Alex Proyas. I don't even know. How, is that how you say it? Who cares? I think Proyas. 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 Do you know, name Alex Proyas' best movie. Go. His best movie? Well, The Crow, yeah. obviously. No. Uh, it's Knowing with Nicholas Cage. It, it is Knowing. And I think he also did that other cult classic, Dark City, which was, I think, yeah, had, yeah, yeah. it had Jack Bauer in it, too. You know what's funny? He did Knowing, and then he didn't make another movie for seven years. Really? Was he shunned by Hollywood? And then he made Gods of Egypt. And then he made Gods of Egypt, and then he never made another full length and he, <laughs> motion picture ever. And then he got shunned from that, too. I mean, this is a very well-made movie. It's it is. competently directed, it's, put it that way. Well, put, let's preview, you know, what we're going to talk about here. But, like, it's it's a well, it's a good-looking movie. Yes. Well-made. But what happened behind the scenes, Drew? So, uh, should we blame this guy? We'll talk about it. Yeah, we'll talk we need to it. talk about it. Because it's there's there's some stuff to be talked about, put it that way. Yeah. Uh, IMDB 7.5 out of 10. I think that's probably about right, probably, but about I liked right. it more. About right. It's not everybody's cup of tea, but it's most. 
84 percent rotten tomato pretty high is there. this our high yeah. it's not our highest because probably t2 is but this has to be one of our highest up reviewed there. rotten tomato movies i'm surprised metacritic 71 percent pretty good be good letterbox 3.7 out of 5 that's also pretty high on yeah, there it's, it's a well it's a well-liked movie it's a good movie and, did this do well or yes. is this like is this like after the fact like no did this it make did money? well it did well. Yeah, it did. It's uh, I can jump to the budget. We'll come back to the synopsis, but it had a budget of 23 mil. I think it wound up being something like 30 after reshoots and all that stuff mm. with the tragedy, and it made over 94. So okay. it, it was pretty good. Interesting. Especially Interesting. in 94, it's, it's a good yeah. return. Eric Draven and his fiance are brutally murdered by members of a violent inner city gang. On the anniversary of their death, Eric rises from the grave and assumes the gothic mantle of the Crow, a supernatural avenger, tracking down the thugs responsible for the crimes and mercilessly murdering them. Eric eventually confronts head gangster Top Dollar to complete his macabre game. mission. He that is macabre. Let me tell you, yeah. like I think I even said that when when you're pulling out people's eyes and lighting them on fire and breathing in the smoke. That is yeah. the macabre. That's, that is the macabre. That is the occult. <laughs> it's the occult. It's in Ray's yep. occult there. Yes. So, uh, I like the gothic mantle too. Anyway, taglines. Oh, this, I mean, this is the winner right here. It can't rain all the time. <laughs> nothing, nothing is trivial. This one's no. lame to me. Believe no. in angels. It's on the poster. Get it out of my face. Next. In a world without justice, one man was chosen to protect the innocent. Shut up. Well, I mean, he, he, wasn't, he was innocent, but like he's not protecting all he's, of the innocent. He was brought back to bring revenge. Lies. Get it out of my face. Next. Real love is forever. Okay. I mean, fine. Now this one, I don't know if these are, this is like fighting words here, but darker than the bat. Whoa. whoa. Are they invoking something there? Like what's up whoa, with that? Whoa. Yeah, so it's like darker it. than Batman? Is this like a, hey, Batman I, 89? Well, like, I mean, I mean, it is rated R and you yeah. know, so it's darker. It, it is. Kills people. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm going with, the, oh, I can't rain all the time. I'm going with real love is forever. You know, call me sentimental, you know? <laughs> he brought it back. That's, yeah. that's love brought him back. Yeah, love brought him back. Shelly, Shelly Webster. Shelly Webster. Uh, we already talked about financials, so let's jump to awards. Now, you guys know how we do it on this show. And if you're Ooh. new to the show, there's one major award that we like to talk about, the MTV Movie and TV gold, Awards. Gold hey. popcorn. So I got I have three categories. It was nominated for two, and it won one. Let's start with the first one. So look, 1995 MTV Movie Awards, MTV Best Movie. Check this out. So it did not win that, but the other category, category mates, whatever it is, <laughs> you had Speed, you had Forrest Gump, you had Interview with a Vampire, and then you had Pulp Fiction, which ultimately wow. won. Like, come on. That's a Damn. great year for movies. So uh, Forrest Gump obviously doesn't fit in this category. No. You know, it's not an MTV movie award. No, it could fit in the Oscars, but like not <laughs> in the MTV. You know, it's like Forrest Gump's it's very good. Like, what a, it's a great movie. But it's like, it's, get it out of here, right? Steven Spielberg yeah. is like, I I, I, I spit yeah. on the MTV yeah. movie <laughs> We're talking heroin overdoses. We're talking, yeah. we're talking vampires, sexy vampires. Yeah. We're talking buses going over 55. <laughs> and we're talking about the crow here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we're living in the grime. All right, it, Forrest, it get, is your, the grime. get your double White House visit out of here, Forrest. The filth. The film from 1995. Did you ever watch an interview with a vampire? I've seen parts of it. I've never actually seen it all the way through, but... Sexy ass thriller. Drill. It is, right? Because isn't it yeah. Kirsten Dunst? Isn't it creepy? Because she's super young in that. If yeah, I'm not she's super young, right? but I'm not even talking about that for sexy. I'm talking about Tom Cruise and Brad Pitt being yeah, sexy ass vampires. <laughs> I just know the cover and the cover's burned in my mind. Because like, yeah. you have Tom Cruise with the mouth and the, the teeth. It looks so yeah. weird to see him dressed in makeup. Because so, like Tom Cruise doesn't wear makeup unless he's Les Grossman. <laughs> like really when does he wear makeup he doesn't yeah, yeah. yeah he is who he is right so is that like the only other movie where a prosthetic um yeah. let's see okay so here's the other one best male performance posthumously that's how you say that right posthumously you got it it's like a uh it's a heath ledger situation 1995 yeah. for best male performance brandon lee he ultimately lost, but the other guys, John Travolta, Pulp Fiction, Keanu Reeves, yeah. Speed, Tom Hanks, again, Forrest Gump, and then Brad Pitt from Interview with a Vampire. So why did Brad Pitt win over Tom Cruise? I think he's in it more, I think. Is that what it is? I think he's, he's yeah, Tom, Tom Cruise is the bad guy in Interview with a Vampire. I think Brad Pitt's yeah. probably has more screen time. Interesting. 
Interesting. Yeah. And then it won a third one. So it won in the third category. It was best song. So, But it didn't even do that. Stone Temple Pilots did that. Yeah, I know. That's what I'm saying. So that's the thing, right? Do you know this song? The Big Empty by Stone Temple Pilots? Yeah. I would have talked about that. The conversation. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like yeah. I want to talk about uh, the, the soundtrack in a second, but the other songs for this were Warren G. Regularly. Stop it. Stop it right now. That's the best song. I know. That's, that's dumb that, that Stone Temple Pilots won. Elton John, Can You Feel the Love Tonight for The Lion King. <sighs> Girl, you'll be a woman soon. Pulp Fiction, and then Madonna. I'll remember with honors. Mm, no, like, regulate. How do you beat that song? How do you beat regulate? You know, it's crazy. I don't know, especially in the mid '90s, like Warren G. Like I don't yeah. know, the Stone Temple Pilots too. Big dog and Warren G had to Great regulate. Mm. So let's talk about the soundtrack. Did you? Did, so are you aware of the soundtrack? Did, were you aware? Because yeah. I don't know how big of a crow guy you were. No, I, it's funny. Cause I hadn't seen the crow, you know, in my formative years, but I did know that the soundtrack was a thing, right? Yeah. I knew it was a thing. Big soundtracks made their way around, you know, even if you hadn't seen the movie, because soundtracks used to be a big deal. We all know this. Um, but yeah, I didn't own it. I knew of it. I knew people who had it. And I assume you had it. Oh yeah, I had definitely had it. I think, but it's weird because like, I didn't like this kind of music per se. Like, mm-hmm. I, I liked all music, I guess, at the time. But you know, th- this thing topped the Billboard 200. It sold 3.8 yeah. million copies. It was certified three time platinum. <laughs> you know, it's like it was a big deal. So the the one song that really stands out to me on this, and I have the track list in front of us, is "Burn" by The Cure. They wrote yeah. it for this movie. And it's the the song that's playing as he's getting the makeup ready and all that other stuff. Whenever I hear that song, it's just instantly th- this this yeah. movie plays in my head. And like bands like Machines of Love and Grace, Nine Inch Nails, Rage Against the Machine, Rollins Band, My Life with the Thrill Kill Cult. You could name all these yeah. whatever, right? Jesus and the yeah. Mary Chain, like the Violent Femmes, the were, Tenement Violent, Blues. Violent Femmes were huge. Um, yeah, yeah. Usually a soundtrack has like one killer song and then the rest is, is like kind of filler. I don't I don't know how they compile these things. But not every soundtrack has this type of lineup, right? No. So I mean this is big time. And yeah. it, it it to me it's the like industrial metal slash whatever. I yeah, don't even it's, know it's, grunge. It's like post it's almost like post grunge. Sort of. Yeah, industrial's a a word. Uh, yeah, I, I could call it industrial. It's like it, it's like pre it's like pre Marilyn Manson but like yeah. post Nirvana like uh like a uh, introduction right yeah if, we have uh, for, STP. for lack of a better word I think between STP and and Nine yeah. Inch Nails as well like Nine Inch Nails is industrial right I don't I'm not a fan like I'm not a, a I'm not against them but I don't I didn't really listen to them but like MTV would call it like be like a buzz yeah a buzz bands buzz ballads <laughs> buzz bands not buzz ballads but buzz bands where it's like oh this is like you got to listen to this new band and it was this type of music right yeah, it was it this was. type of rock it was I'll tell you what they missed a big opportunity by not putting a, a fake song by Hangman's Joke on there because I really want to know like why did they not have yeah. the full song? Does the full song of It Can't Rain All the Time exist? Does that exist, or did they just yeah, make ten you, seconds? You gotta hope it is. Look, not every movie is Rockstar Drew. We can't have it. You know, not every movie is as good as Rockstar, where there's an entire album. You're right with with the fake band, right? We got lucky when you look back on Rockstar. Yeah. I mean, talk about a badass soundtrack. Like, yeah. We've talked. I mean, we did the episode. Go back and listen to it. But man, that soundtrack is is killer. It's so good. So yeah, for those that don't know, obviously, if you haven't watched the movie, Eric, Eric Draven is a man who was murdered in the very beginning of this movie. He's the crow. And he's, I guess, the lead of this band yeah. called Hangman's Joke. Why couldn't there have been a scene where Hangman's Joke moved on without him? Yeah. You know, they replaced him and like he went to go see them like from the rafters. Oh, he's that would have been. He's watching down. As a crow? Like, yeah, checking in on his old mates, right? Why yeah. that? Why that could easily have been a scene. They could have been playing at the pit, at the at the at the bar or wherever that the the scumbags oh, yeah. that. <laughs> scumbags right? join. Yeah, they like, should. Why, there should have been a scene where he's like, you know, he gives the Timmy Olyphant, "You son of a bitch" smile when he sees them still living their dreams. Right well, yeah, at the this is 1994. Like times were simpler then. They they, they couldn't put that in because it would make yeah. it too complicated. <laughs> But it's you're right. It should have yeah. been in there. It All should right. have been. That would have been a great. All right. Let's say you and me and a couple other of our friends are in a band yeah. together, right? When we're we're a, a, a 
not successful band. We're we're successful in the local area, right? We're respected. Yeah. We're respected. All of a sudden, you die. You're dead. You're gone. <laughs> Bye. See you later. A year <laughs> later, would you be upset or proud that we found a replacement for you and moved on? Oh hell, I'd be proud of you. If I what if I what if, died? Yeah, you're dead. Like so, if, you wouldn't you wouldn't want the band to die with you? Well, like that would be kind no. of like that would be kind of epic, though, wouldn't it? And, and wouldn't that be kind of like? Well, I mean, you oh, guys man. could name yourself something else. I that's, guess. Well, that's but, special. That's special. You so know? here, do you need to? So is the rule that are you allowed to keep the same name if you're the lead singer? So if a guitarist dies, you yeah. you don't have to change the name. But no. if you're like the lead singer or you're the front man of the band and they yeah. die, like, I feel like you yeah. have to maybe so, rename it. Kurt Cobain died. There was, there's no Nirvana too, yeah. right? Yeah, They're not going right. to make that, right? Yeah. Or think, you know, how, what was, uh, what was some of the bands, like all those guys, like Scott Weiland had a side project. The guys had this, yeah. like the Velvet Revolver. Velvet Revolver. Yeah, right, right, right. So if you take, let's uh-huh. say I die and I'm the lead singer, then I think I'd be okay. fine if you guys were successful. I'd be what, happy for you. What but, if we replaced you? And then we we blew up. We were super famous. If you replace, then I'd would be you, upset. Would you then yeah. be dead? Be upset from the grave? No. So if I'm dead, I'm not upset. I'm happy for you. But if I'm alive and you replace me, <laughs> yeah, then I don't want you to. We would never replace you alive. We'd have you murdered first. <laughs> it's my mic stand, man. This yeah. is yeah. this is my mic stand. <laughs> These are my cables. <laughs> These are my cables. <laughs> mm. <laughs> to the to the five listeners that get that joke, <laughs> and then your wife would say. All the talent just walked out of this yeah. room. All the talent. Oh man, Eric Draven. All the talent went out that window. Let me tell you, he he <laughs> fell to his death oh, no. from the window. Oh, no. It was he was. Yeah, we'll come back to the band because the I band have was dead. I told yeah. you all about. I have their names. I want to yeah. speculate on what they sound yeah. like in a minute yeah. here. But so you you mentioned you're not really a crow guy, but you mentioned this on the last. I remember whether it was last episode or a couple episodes ago, but. I think it was the first time we did Problem Child and you brought up this topic, which I think has it's been a really great way to look at some of these movies. You said it's a movie that you're 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 allowed to watch, but you feel like you're getting away with something. This yeah. is one that I probably wasn't allowed to watch and I felt like I was getting away from something because yeah. it had this specter, like a literal specter of of Brandon Lee's death, the tragedy of that. It was like really gothic and yep. gross and dirty and dingy looking. Sure. It was rated R, it was Hyper violent. It was, I mean, it was but, just a really gritty and grungy movie. Yeah, but for some reason, for people in our age range that were born in the mid '80s, this may have been your first R-rated yeah. movie that you've seen, or or one of the first. Which is strange because it's not like a type of movie that no. gravitate towards kids. When it first came out in '94, when I saw a preview for it, I was I was a little afraid of this movie. Like a little, like it seemed like a horror movie to me. And it didn't have that effect on you. You were you were intoxicated by it. I just thought it was maybe it was because it made me feel like I was a badass or something by like maybe. watching it. Because yeah. it it yeah. was cool. Because he, I mean, it was based on a comic book, so I didn't know about that at the time. But it was cool. It was like this dude in cool makeup taking yeah. revenge for something, and it, mm-hmm. it felt like something you're not allowed to watch. And yeah. it was on HBO, and I remember it being on the hot box at like my relative's house. I had the VHS and I'm pretty sure I bought it, you know, it was years later, but I, but I had the VHS and I mean, I liked watching this movie. I, I, I really yeah. liked this movie growing up yeah. and it was one of the first R rated movies that I remember right. like yeah. being really into. And it was kind of, it was kind of like horror violence uh, in, uh, in opposition of say like a Die Hard, which yep. is like police violence or, you know, good guys versus bad guys, machine guns, shooting violence, which I was very much desensitized to at that point, yeah. even as like a 10 year old. Right. But this type of violence, like the, the stabbings, the, 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 the grimy murder, the, it's like the Gonzo dank, style, yeah, right? the dank like, atmosphere. It is. It's like, it's, you're getting away with it. It's like, I shouldn't be watching this. This is there's something <laughs> wrong. Here. Yeah. Well, I, I think the thing about this, when you watch Die Hard, yeah, I mean, terrorists could take over like a, a building or something, but this is like you walk in the wrong part of town in New York yeah. City, and this could happen to you. It's like, different. You it's stabbed. yeah. It's different violence. It's it's a different kind of violence. It's a more, it's more. Uh, the Felt word more sex, real. The word sexual keeps coming to mind, but <laughs> it's not the word I want. It's the sexual violence. <laughs> the sexual violence. <laughs> I mean, it, it, I know what you're saying though, because this movie. I, I said this to you before, man. You just like watch this, and you feel like you're getting a disease by watching it. Yeah. Like, it, like right. th- maybe it's the needles in unprotected, the heroin scene. That's what it is. It's unprotected violence. It is. It's it's like you better 
go to the yeah. drugstore and get some go protection to, yeah. to watch this movie. Go to the clinic movie. after watching all this violence. You need to get antibiotics yeah. after watching this movie. Yeah. Don't you feel that way? Like you watch yes. it, it's so gritty and grimy and filthy. Like Absolutely. I felt like I need a shower after I watched it. Absolutely. This movie. It's so disgusting. The rain was sticky, Drew. Yes, it was. From the skies. It, it was, man. And it it has that feel of it. I mean, it, it was officially, from what I understand, the first R-rated, quote, superhero movie, even though you could say it's not really... I mean, yes, it's a superhero movie in that it's a superhero in a comic, but... Yeah, he has powers. I don't know, some, yeah, some people would actually credit this thing for starting that hyper-gritty, dark, sort of just dingy, gross look dingy, to stuff. Dingy, gross, grimy. You know another movie that reminds me of that? Requiem that, for a Dream. Like, it has yeah. the same feeling that I watch when I, when I watch this, mm-hmm. and... And you're just seeing Eric Draven in the outfit, which we'll, we'll talk about in a second. Like, it's just, it makes you feel dirty. And I think that's part of why I felt like I was getting away with something by watching it. And it was yeah. a rated R movie. And, but I watched this a lot growing up. Like, I just liked this movie a lot. So did you, uh, were you familiar with like the, the trouble? I mean, outside of the tragedy of Brandon Lee's passing on the, on, or, or death, accidental death, not even a passing, were yeah. you, Familiar with like the production of this movie and all the other crap that was no, going on? I didn't. I just thought there was a, an incident involving Brandon Lee and it was unfortunate, but I didn't know that there was more to it. I Man, so I was doing a bunch of reading before we did this, and I won't bore people with all of the details here, but I you I think this was Alex Proyas' first movie, if I'm not mistaken. I could be wrong on that. I don't know about that. Can you tell me? Can you correct um, me if I'm wrong? Let's see here. So he did Crow in 1994. And he was doing a bunch of music videos, yeah. But it wasn't a movie. Before, Looks like right? his first movie. If you're if you're the director, like yeah, it looks you're like the his boss first movie. Of the set, yeah. right? Like I know yep. the producers have a lot to do with it, where the producers are basically helping with stuff and all that. They're helping yep. get the movie made. But if you're the director, I mean, ultimately you're the CEO of the movie. You're you're the sure. boss of the movie, so you have responsibility for everything that's going on. Yep. And I know. Look, this this has been talked about. A million times before we're doing this episode in 2024, but we do have to talk about Brandon Lee's death. But leading up to that, I was just reading about some of these things, and it said there's a ton of accidents that happened on the set. All these people were saying that the film was cursed. So a carpenter got burned. Someone got electrocuted. Mm. Uh, a, a, a screwdriver got embedded in a guy's hand. Stuntman <laughs> broke a bunch of ribs, falling through a roof. Uh, there was a, a sculptor on set who went berserk and drove his car through the prop room. A hurricane destroyed some of the sets. And oh yeah, by the way, the lead star of the movie died. Like, yeah. it's crazy. So, and there was a bunch of other stuff too. I saw Empire Magazine said that there was coke abuse on set. The cameramen were shooting while high. Like, I don't want to be laughing that about this. That might be why the stuff above happened. You, you, you lead with all the bad luck stuff happening and then you drop that there was cocaine use rampant on set. But the cocaine right? use is probably responsible for a lot of that Decide beside from the hurricane. You know, <laughs> I don't know what a hurricane or cocaine is like, but they were in North Carolina. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not. I'm gonna first and foremost, I'm not blaming him for the death of, of Brandon sure. Lee at all, but I'm blaming the director for allowing all the other stuff, the shenanigans to be happening on set. This is this is kind of like substitute teachers in like everyone's running wild, right? <laughs> this if guy doesn't know what he's if, doing. If most if most movie if most filmmakers are are used to having the director like have us have a sense of being the boss on set. And you have a guy that's not being the letting everything slide. This is going to turn into a free for all party, right? <laughs> I thought this was funny. It said the crew went into toilets in between shots to snort, and then, <laughs> then it said that one crew member recalled hearing the sound of a sneeze one day, and Brandon Lee was annoyed, and he said someone just lost fifty bucks because yeah. like, they sneezed it out. And there was like a, a whole thing with a fire destroyed some of the sets. There's just a lot going on, and the whole the whole other point of this, and this is where I wonder if this led to like the death, was that they said that there was a ton of cost cutting on set, and they they were trying to make a movie with less money than what they had. There was this whole thing about why they filmed in North Carolina too, because it was a right to work state, so they were getting away with certain pay and conditions because it wasn't part of whatever the normal unionized Hollywood was, and then there was this whole thing about just the death, right? So we need to talk about this. And again, I know it's been done over and over and over, but I think the key question for this, and maybe others have debated it, is do you think this movie was affected positively or negatively by Brandon Lee's death? And I would say, it have been yeah. successful? I say this with all due respect, and this is going to sound terrible, but it absolutely was 
the movie was boosted by the death, like the 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 buzz of it, right? And that's and that's a terrible thing, right? But the, right. the facts are the facts. I feel like the news that came out about it, it's showed more of a spotlight on it because X happened than why people going to see it ended up happening, I feel. I feel like this movie would not have made as much money as it did. I feel like this is a very good movie, but also kind of a flawed movie. For a low-budget action movie in 1994 to make nearly $100 million seems kind of improbable, doesn't it? It does. And I think that the extra attention, unfortunate attention as it was, kind of led more people to go see it. Makes the movie have more of a, um, what would you say, there's a sort of a lore to the movie, uh, uh, an infatuation, a gross infatuation to it from, oh, let's go see the movie where the guy died. Maybe we can spot the scene, you know? Yeah. Some people think that way, right? They do. So I feel like, yeah, it definitely added to the popularity of the movie, unfortunately. I've, obviously, I'd rather live in a world where he didn't get shot and died, unfortunately, on set. And we could go on to see, because it seemed like the future was definitely bright for this dude. Obviously, being the son of Bruce Lee... And it was a great performance, right? I mean, yeah. it, was, it was definitely a unique performance. And him being in his 20s, you know, who knows what he could have turned into. Do you think that some people didn't go because they didn't want to see it? Because it's like, I don't want to see that movie where the guy dies. You know, I don't want to see the scene where he got yeah, shot. I, I feel like for every like eight, for the like two out of every 10 would say that. And eight That's, out of 10 yeah. would be curious about it, right? Well, and it is, you talk about the word macabre. It is sort of macabre because... You said this before we started recording, but the guy is playing a character that's dead that got shot and yeah. came back to life and is now violently, hyper violently killing everybody in the manner by which he was tortured and, and killed too. So there's that sort of sort of sick sick uh, infatuation with it as well. It, it's yeah. a very macabre is probably the right word when yeah. you think about what this is. And you know, we talked about how gring, grungy and dingy it looks, all of that put together, it gives it such a unique vibe that I've never seen from any other really movie that exists, honestly. They don't really make things like this. It has such a unique yeah. feel to it. Yeah, and, and unfortunately, it's another reason why it makes this feel like a dangerous watch, right? Yes. You yeah, know? exactly. It's like, oh, the yeah. movie where that guy died. Yeah. You know, and like you said, he was a very up-and-coming actor at that time, and who knows what would have been. Uh, I looked this up because I was curious and I was I was trying to understand like what was the scene that was supposed to you know have been where it happened and it was in the flashbacks where Fun Boy kills him and there's a whole write up and I'll put some links in the show notes because I found some interesting links if you guys are interested just to read up on some of them uh, the Wikipedia page does a really good job of of explaining this but I wonder I mean again back to to that director but. It sounded like originally Funboy wasn't supposed to shoot him, but Proyas wanted to change the scene. So he changed it. And then that caused, you know, whatever was happening. But that lived with Michael. I'm going to say his name wrong. Is it Massey? Massey? Michael Massey? Yeah, Massey. Yeah. yeah he's a, I mean, he's a famous actor, right? He died in 2016. But can you imagine being the person that oh. did that? It's like the Rust situation that's happening right now yeah. in 2024. Sure. Yeah. You, uh, you never forget it, right? Something that you take with you always. It's, it's the same thing, you know, if you have a car accident, accidentally, you know, people die in car accidents. I'm sure if you're, you know, quote unquote caused it, even if it was a complete and total accident, non-drunk mm-hmm. situation, you're never going to forget that. It's, it's something that lives with you forever. And he was a guy that pulled the trigger that ended up shooting a guy who died. It, and it's as much a tragedy for him as it is for Brandon yeah. Lee. Obviously, the guy's still alive or, or, or survived that incident, but... You know, it's, he was a victim as well. What do you, what do you think about this? Because I know again in 2024, there's the whole Rust situation with Alec Baldwin and and the, and the armorer and all that other stuff. But the specifics of the accident for this, and they've said that people say that this accident is is what changed you know prop standards or, or gun safety standards on films. The way things are done. Obviously, there's been some accidents since then, but. The actual situation of this is ridiculous to me. We're talking about some of the chaos on set. The revolver was supposed to be fired from 12 to 15 feet away. Dummy cartridges were exchanged for blank rounds, which feature live powder, but no actual bullet. So, you know, there's no projectile. The production company sent the firearm specialist home early. 
who was responsible for Oof. guns, <laughs> and and they were they basically responsibility for guns was given to the prop assistant who was unaware quote unaware of the rule for inspecting firearms before any handling. Therefore, the barrel was not checked for obstructions, and the time came to load it with a blank. The bullet from the dummy round was already trapped in there. It's called the squib load. Basically, it shot a live round, and and it yeah. it shot him in in the abdomen, and it and it killed him. And it's it's that kind of thing shouldn't happen. Yeah. It's it's avoidable. If there's a scene involving a firearm and they sent the firearm expert or whatever home yeah. specialist, then what's the point of the firearm specialist? Why are you there? He should be there for all firearm scenes. It's crazy to me. I, and like, who, who sent him home early? Was it the director? I'm just, I'm just speculating, Drew. Yeah, I know. Speculating. So the thing that I kept thinking about was – I know that there was, you know, obviously there's lawsuits and investigations now with Rust. I keep talking about that, but how did somebody not pay for this at that time? Like whether it was their fault or not, I'm just shocked that, and maybe, I don't know if the internet existed in 1994 in the, in the way that it does now, do you think this would have been a bigger deal? I mean, this guy's a huge star. It's not like he's an up and coming star. He gets killed on the set of a very like anticipated movie by an accident that was clearly avoidable. I mean, it was an accident and I don't blame like certain people, but how did somebody not go down for this? It's crazy to me. It's the nineties, man. It's the nineties. You know, drug, drug loving early nineties, right? It's that's what it seems like. Right. Yeah. Cause it's like, I, I just don't know how this wasn't, I know. And I know it was a big deal at the time, but I don't know why, you know, it's like nobody in jail over some of that, I guess. And then, then everyone else keeps on going on with their lives. It's like, Life's short, man. That's yeah. all it takes is something like that. It's it's crazy, but it, it should have never happened, and it's a shame. Like I think yeah. Brandon Lee could have been a really big star had he lived. I guess it's hard to like find the blame, like where the blame ultimately lies, because there's so many people that probably had eyes on that firearm that just didn't do the thorough check. Yeah, you know, and it's just unfortunate. You mentioned Nirvana earlier. Like I don't know if you ever feel this way, but I think Kurt Cobain. And Brandon Lee, I always kind of associate them because they died young. They have a cult following of fans and people that really like them. And it's also the timing of it, too. I always sort of think of the two at the same time just because of when it happened. Yeah, because I think, didn't they, I mean, when did Kirk Cobain die? 94? 94 is the same 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 year. So, yeah, pretty much very close to each other. So I could totally see that comparison. Yeah. Uh, One other point uh, point of interest that I thought was cool was Ch- Chad Stahelski was brought in and I think he was the body double and I think he's also stunt double. But uh, mm-hmm. if you may know him from director of John Wick series and famous stunt man and, and whatnot, him yeah. and uh, him and Keanu Reeves have worked together quite a bunch. I think he was Keanu mm-hmm. Reeves stunt man on the matrix as well. But a lot of the scenes, I think I saw he died with three days left of shooting so a lot of the flashback scenes were were reshot completely. Uh, there was a bunch of other things that were reshot. A lot of other things like him putting the makeup on, I think, was not him as well. So, um, but un- un- unfortunately, he died too soon. And you, know, you can't talk about this movie and not talk about that. But I don't want to dwell on it. Let's talk about Eric Draven. Yeah, let's move on himself. What do you think of of Hangman's joke? Now you mentioned we only heard a little bit of it, but if I told you some of the bandmate names. Can you tell me what kind of band you think this is? Okay. So let me let me name the band members, and then you can tell me what genre you think they play. So you got Eric Draven, who's obviously the lead guitarist. Ooh. And then I think this is taken from the TV show, by the way, because it was a Mark Descacos TV show. But anyway, okay. the other band members are Mo Devious, mm. Gunner Lance, yeah. Tex Fowler, mm-hmm. and Brian Harden with an O, Brian. 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 Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Brian Harden is Brian. the is the drummer for sure. <laughs> He's got to be right. <laughs> yeah, Brian. Yeah, <laughs> I feel like Tex and Gunner are guitarists slash singers, and Mo Devious is is a bass player. Bass, definitely, definitely. <laughs> I'm singing the same. <laughs> Mo Devious. <laughs> But I feel like they have to be some sort of, like, I want to call them like a Smashing Pumpkins style. Yeah. You know, maybe even an STP because maybe because the soundtrack got me, got me with the with the, the whole big empty scenario. I'm thinking, I'm thinking, I'm thinking the first, the first thing that popped in my mind was, was, uh, was Smashing Pumpkins. I don't know why, <laughs> like World is Vampire. 
you know, it definitely zero, seems. those types of songs made me think that's the type of songs that they like to play. It wasn't Chris Cole band. You don't think it's like Chris Cole no. band? I, I was I getting a Chris so. Cole band vibe from no, them. Like not colorful. At all. And, and I'm not, I'm not saying tonight, tonight, um, pumpkins. I'm, I'm talking, you know, rat in a cage, zero, those types of, those types of, <laughs> types of bangers. Mo Devious is definitely the bassist. It's definitely the bassist. <laughs> like, it's like Lexi Fox from Steel Panther. <laughs> and Tex Fowler. Like, I, yeah. I just think that's great. I don't know. I want to know what they sound like. They, they played It Can't Rain All the Time. I just imagine that being on Monster Ballads. You turn on yeah. the TV. Oh, that was at, their ballad. That, yeah. It had to be, right? Is that is is it? It can't rain all the time. Is that is that the song? Is that it's the solo he, he played on the rooftop? No, no I think that's is that something else. But like, I feel like, it, like, but that could be construed <laughs> as one of their songs, right? I wish I could play that right now without getting a copyright strike. Because if you like, if you ever have not seen this movie, I'm gonna put that in the show notes too. I'm gonna have a ton of a ton of links in here. That is one of the all time greatest solos that I need to hear the song ever <laughs> because it's so good. It's like playing in the middle of the rain in like a storm. He stole the guitar from the pawn shop and he's just playing on the roof mm. because he's got to get drown out the sorrows, man. That's yeah, that's what it, it is. Do it, so man. he he obviously died. What did you think of the way that they died and what do you know why they were killed? Yeah, it was a little confusing and I think it got cleared up a little more as the movie went on, but a uh, long story short Top Dollar needed people out of that building for whatever reason. Why? He wanted to own the building. I don't know. So he's trying to like scare people out of their out of their houses, right? Out of their apartments. And uh, unfortunately, it got a little messy. I guess, right? <laughs> what did they say? It was just supposed to be a simple sweep and clear. Sweep and clear. Yeah, sweep and clear. That, that I guess a sweep and clear involves a rape. I don't know. That's how T Bird's gang gets down. As long as they don't murder somebody. Unfortunately, Draven shows up and turns it into a murder fest. I don't know. So you don't think they were supposed to kill him? No, but like they could have, I don't know. They could have just beat him up. They didn't have to throw him out the window. They did. They didn't have to. You know, it's like when you watch a movie and I don't know, there's always one guy in a gang. It's just like a loose cannon. Yeah, you know, like Reservoir Dogs. You think of Mister Mister Pink or yep. not Mister Pink? Mister Mister Blue was Mr. it? Mister Blue. I can't remember which one it was. I forget what which one it was. Brown. Or you Mr. watch Brown. Heat, the guy from <laughs> yeah. Heat that yeah. that is. I forgot his name too, but he just he's like psychopathic. I mean, obviously these guys are not all with yeah. it when they're yeah. out there, but that guy. I mean, maybe he just went a little too far and he and yeah. he killed him. And once one person goes too far, it just turns into a shit fest. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> He's just gonna kill everybody. Yeah. So I, I mean, I, I wonder what would have happened if he didn't come home. What would have happened? And do you think they would have left? Because part of why they were they were the last people they wanted out. So Top Dollar wanted them out because they were, I guess, leading protests on these forced evictions. So they wanted to basically scare them and say, "Get the hell out of here." So, but you guys heard in the beginning what turning into the crow is. You heard Sarah describe the the, yes. the rules or whatever happens. Brutally what did described. you think of the concept of the crow? And, and maybe we could start with like the look of so, it. Okay. I, I have two schools of thought and they're a little opposing, but I want to make it make sense. But I like the idea of like the crow being his little like watcher buddy, right? <laughs> his little henchman. His little henchman. Sidekick. And like, it, like it'll like fly on his freaking shoulder. Pretty badass. Yeah. But on the other hand, personally, I don't know if I've ever shared this. I hate birds. I don't like birds. <laughs> You've not shared this. They kind of creep me out a little bit. I kind of don't like birds because they're like dinosaurs. Yeah, I don't know. They're not. I don't know about the dinosaur thing about. But it's just like they're flying around. <laughs> they have all. They have these ulterior motives. They live these <laughs> lives that we know nothing about up in the sky. I don't. I don't know. They're like. It, it seems like they're they're they're, they're up to something. And do you I, feel I don't like, like it's, I don't like birds. Do you feel like it's weird when you keep a bird as a pet because like a bird it's should the worst be flying? Pet. It's the worst pet you could have. It's kind of because, messed up to clip their wings and stuff, yeah, isn't it? Because the bird is it's born to fly and you're like, I'm gonna keep this in my house and clip its wings so it can never fly. It's kind of messed up. At least when you have a fish, even though it's in a small ass tank, at least it's swimming. Right. Yeah, it's still swimming. Yeah. It's like you're right, I guess. It's like, it's like can you can you imagine a, like buying a fish from a store and like hooking hooking up like an oxygen oxygen <laughs> tank to its gills so like to pump water into it, but but not having it in the water. This is the headliner right here. It has to be. <laughs> I, I agree with you. And I think about birds too. And I think about it. It's like, yeah, you say fish can't do anything or a dog can love you. People have lizards. 
But even a lizard, it's still running around in the cage. You're right. Yeah. Like a bird, I mean, it could flap its wings. But yeah. I always feel bad. I'm not saying yeah, that terrible. you shouldn't have a bird if you have one, but I don't think I could have one personally. Yeah. But I, I also, I, I thought of it myself through the movie. Like, oh, I bet if that bird got hurt, it would hurt him too. You think so? You, but you they you caught it. I kind of, but but they never explained it, and I'm glad they didn't. And I'm glad that it took to the end of the movie for the big bad to figure it out. Yeah, and I'm I glad it didn't happen accidentally. And all of a sudden, like someone, one of those scumbags figured it out. You know. I want to come back to his look in a second, but while you're talking about that, I want to mention this because another thing that I did not know about this was, and I guess it was used in the show and it may be in the comic, I'd never read it, but there was this whole subplot originally, it was called the Skull Cowboy, and it was that guy from The Hills Have Eyes, that one actor, he's very famous, if you saw his picture you would know who I'm talking about, I can't remember the guy's name, but... There was this guy that was supposed to appear. If you, if you're familiar with Spawn or the Spawn comics, Cogliostro, he's sort of like his guide and the Spawn's guide. It's kind of like that, where basically the way this was originally set up was that Eric could only go after people that he basically had responsible was, for his own death. Was wronged, yeah. Yes, he revenge couldn't is, kill anyone else. Yeah, revenge is the only reason why this guy returned yes. from the dead. Yes, and if he went off of that, he would lose his powers. So there's this whole subplot. And again, I'll put a link in the show notes. I, I, honestly, I'm sorry I'm talking about all these other things, but it is a really fascinating read. And yeah. I think you guys will find it interesting. But I'll, again, I'll put a link in the show notes, but this was cut. So it wasn't part of the movie. Uh, and and I think they simplified it to be what you said, which is, hey, the bird is, is the power. Yeah. Because at those scenes, and they had already filmed these scenes, by the way, a lot of these scenes where Ooh. he was in the bell tower or whatever the heck it was at the church and all that stuff. And it was already set that this, this guy was going to show up. So him losing his powers and all that other stuff, it was part of the other movie and the way that he wore the electrical tape. I don't know if you noticed, did yes. you notice that? Yeah. Oh yeah. I just thought it was like a fashion thing. I didn't get yeah. it. Like, cause I thought like, Hey, it's 1994 <laughs> and he's wearing black electrical tape. Like who's he, his Marilyn, who's he Marilyn Manson? What do you think? Yeah. He's wearing like because isn't that a thing? Like uh, I just felt like, hey, yeah. another reason why this movie looks so dirty. Like yeah. his shirt's ripped, so he's got black. It's a very, tape it's a very emo it. thing to have it's done like, is to put tape on your shirt. Right? You know, it's like you think about AFI from like the two thousands, yeah. where it's like Davy Havoc's got black mm-hmm. electrical tape on his arms. So apparently that was because it was to cover up an injury that happened during when he lost his powers. It's like a lot of yeah. really interesting stuff. But anyway, mm-hmm. I thought that was interesting because you said about the bird being the power. I think it worked better because it was simpler and it yeah. didn't need this convoluted thing of this guide guiding yeah. him through the underworld. Yeah. too many characters. And I understood like right away. And, and this is easy storytelling that he wasn't going to go around killing random people because that's not who this guy was. He was a, yeah. he was a musician, right? He wasn't some thug that right. got caught up in the wrong line of business or whatever. He wasn't going to, he wasn't going to go around killing random people. He was back for revenge. He was there for revenge. He's going to get revenge. That's all you need. He wasn't going to kill anybody on the street. He didn't plan on killing the the uh, shop. What do you call it? The pawn shop keeper. Like, oh yeah, he, wasn't gonna, he was going to hurt him. He wasn't going to kill him. <laughs> he almost killed him. He took a gamble there. I mean, he took a gamble. Yeah, he could have killed him. <laughs> you, what about his his look? So this is a very iconic look. You mean you mean Sting? Yeah, Sting. <laughs> Sting. <laughs> Who came first, the crow or Sting? It definitely it was definitely the crow. Definitely the crow. Uh, but some yeah. might argue that it was I, Sting. I thought the look was great. I mean. People will throw the word clown around in the movie. I don't think he looked like a clown per se. <laughs> I thought he looked like a, a badass. I don't even know what to call it. He just looked badass. I thought it was great. Whoever whoever came up with that design, fantastic. And um, so good that it, it led famous WCW wrestler Sting to reinvent his entire wrestling character into something iconic. And he even even acted like Brandon Lee as this as that oh, yeah. crow character. Like he took everything from this crow character. So it, this this movie transcended into professional wrestling. It was, well, it was amazing. If you look at Sting before he adopted this look, it was very ni- like '90s, but it was electric neon paint. Yeah. It was very cheesy. He looked very yeah. like much like a goober. I mean, he's still a cool wrestler, sure. but yeah, this and, took him to that next level. And yeah, and and the Crow um, Draven kind of acted like a pro wrestler. Like he was very animated when he was going about getting his revenge too. So. Match made in heaven, you know, or hell. I thought, dude, Brandon Lee's body language when he was walking, like he had that 
you know what I'm talking about? It's hard to describe, yeah. but if you look at the cover of the movie, you can see exactly what I'm talking yeah. about, where he, he's walking with his arms out and he just walks slow. It's yeah. it's so badass, man. Sure. I think he's awesome in this movie. You know, and, and Sting adopted that too. It was, it was awesome. And let me let me ask you, you, you see when he first got out of the grave and he was yeah. climbing up the ladder and he was super jacked. He had the most muscular sculpted back you've ever yeah. seen in your life. Yeah. Man, it's like, Come back from the dead, man. It's it's like it's like doing supersets, right? Uh, like, <laughs> the, does the climbing out of the grave, the six feet, like, is that all it takes to to you get your get your, it? to get your muscle mass jacked back up from sitting down for a year? <laughs> yeah, Rick Mortis. His muscles are so hard. <laughs> oh man, I saw it. there was something crazy too, where it said he. he his birthday happened like while he was filming this or whatever, and he couldn't eat the cake because he was on such a strict diet to oh, be man. so ripped. Yeah. It's not worth it, man. Give me the cake. But it's funny, <laughs> like he he didn't really show his body that much. Just in the beginning. No. Just in the beginning. Yeah, you, you know what they did do though? <laughs> it's a deep cut for all the longtime listeners here. I'm gonna take you guys back to a little website called thegoldencloset.com. And he he wore the tightest like outfits. So you, it's not for sale because obviously it's sold already, but I would love to know how much this is. But he has a moleskin shirt and it's the shirt that he wears. It's like the black tight, tight shirt. Yeah. He had the ripped physique in that, but this was available in the Golden Closet. And the thing about this that I saw that was funny, it has like a sewed on cod piece underwear. <laughs> I think it's a genius idea because how many times have you worn a shirt and it starts to untuck? Like, yeah. do you, don't you want it to stay tucked? And they kept saying that they wanted it to look super tight and super tucked into a shirt. So they sewed like a little cod piece underwear thing like onto cup, this. Like a cup. <laughs> Basically. Now, you don't want your shirt untucked, but at the cost of what? Like, you want it, the shirt to hug your nuts though? Like that's going to be a <laughs> you thing. Wear all, all you wear underwear? You wear boxer day. briefs? No, that's for support, not to like ride up <laughs> to make sure a shirt is tucked in. <laughs> It says a blue neoprene strap was sewn onto the bottom of the shirt to help it keep pulled down and tight during filming. I don't like it. I like it. Give me that shirt for work. There's a I'll reason that. why that fashion statement didn't catch on. <laughs> oh man. I uh I don't know. I we probably we can talk more about this. Let's move on to Officer Albrecht, played by the amazing Ernie Hudson. Mm. I want to talk about Albrecht for a second because I'm trying to understand like what was his deal. They didn't really explain it but i was wondering was his boss in top dollar's pocket or was he just demoted like what was his eh, deal i don't think so uh, if if his boss was then it, it was poorly written that way because to me it just seemed like typical cop uh po- political bullshit you know what i mean yeah you're demoted because all these fires are happening on devil's night and you can't find the killers so i'm busting your ass down to beat cop you know i don't know it didn't matter to the plot, and I'm I'm kind of glad because let's keep the focus on on Draven. I crew. liked that you know you had Sarah who was the vessel by which you were experiencing yeah. the movie, but I liked that Albrecht was in there and Ernie yeah. Hudson was awesome. Yeah, don't get me wrong, I liked I like Albrecht in the movie, but I don't need the shenanigans between him and his boss. Like that's not necessary to an hour and forty minute movie. Is all I'm saying. What do you think of I, his apartment? I think there's more to it, but um. It was maybe cut. That's, and as yeah, far as, that's fair. And what do I think of his apartment? His apartment looks like the apartment of a guy going through a divorce, if you ask me. <laughs> it was pretty clean compared yeah. to the rest of that city. That was the only like yeah. light that you got that mm-hmm. wasn't dark and dirty and filthy. Yeah. Do you know, um, so when Ernie Hudson threw himself into that church at the end of the movie yeah. to help a dead guy get revenge, that's why he's getting a divorce, Drew. Because he just cares so much about justice. When you talk about cops getting too involved in their jobs, that this guy gets so involved that he's helping a dead guy get revenge. That's all he's there for. (laughs) He didn't even need to because – Like if the the dead guy had died a second time, what does that really matter? Yeah, it's true. He didn't really need to. I guess it was because of Sarah, the girl. But at the same time, he's invincible until they get the crow. But But like that's why he's getting divorced, Drew. Because he can't can't leave work alone. Put yourself in his shoes. Did he believe that Eric Draven was actually dead or did he think like it was some other situation or is he just being like, hey man, uh, if the know, paycheck's uh, steady, <laughs> I'll believe I'll anything. anything you say. <laughs> Perfectly cast for that. He's so good. But I don't know, like if put yourself in his shoes, 
Could it be a twin getting revenge for That's his what brother? I mean. It could be. Like you want to talk yourself out of it actually being a ghost, right? Yeah. He he went from being shocked and scared to having a normal conversation on his couch with a ghost in like a less than five seconds. Let's say so maybe, you know. <laughs> let's say that you know he's not a bad ghost. Yeah. Do you yeah, still you want just, a ghost in your apartment? You just want, you just want to know if it's a bad ghost or a good ghost. Yeah. I mean, he's he's a walking corpse, is yeah. what he is. He's not even a. It's not a ghost. Like a ghost, I feel like he can't walk through walls. No, he can't. He can't <laughs> float through a wall. That's a ghost to me. That's the it's definition a, of a, a ghost. Specter. It's a specter. He's not a ghoul. <laughs> he's not a. He's not a. He's not a spook. He's not a specter. He's not a ghoul. <laughs> he's a reanimated corpse. It's, it, does he smell like? But his body looked warm. He looked, he looked like fresh. He looked fresh. He man. did look fresh. Yeah, he looked clean. I mean, he, he wasn't like in. You watch Beetlejuice. Remember when they yeah. come back and it's like when they start going back to their they're shriveling up. Like he yeah, wasn't yeah. shriveled up. Mm-hmm. So I guess you're right. He wasn't a ghost. He was a reanimated corpse. That's that's. Yeah. But it was he in but there. But even even that sounds dirty. Like he looked yeah. clean. This guy. The, the word guy. corpse is is inherently yeah. filthy, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it it's is inherently dirty. <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I don't want to even talk about Sarah. Yeah. Like she's obviously a huge character in the movie, but I, what is there to say? She has a junkie mom, and she's the vessel. Yeah. That, I mean, it sucks for her. I feel bad for yeah. her. Put it that way. You like, know, I told I told you before. I like that she is the uh, she's the equivalent of Danny in yeah. last action last action hero. Uh, same same year maybe I think the movie I think out. it was 94? around the same time if it wasn't exactly the same he's like yeah. she's like Danny from Last Action Hero she's annoying she's not a good actor but she's here to, to guide us through the movie do you feel like she forgave her mom a little fast for making eggs the next morning after I mean being... like she was she she almost lost her mom real quick yeah <laughs> getting an attitude about those eggs Drew <laughs> she's a... her mom came back and oh what's it worth if you're if you're bashing your mom for not being home. And then she's finally home making you eggs. And the first thing you do is give her attitude. That's how you lose your mom twice. I'll tell you what, man. Another reason why this movie just feels so filthy, besides the fact that there are junkies and they're doing yeah. drugs, is a junkie mom like in the movie with the kid that's there. It's like you feel bad for the kid and she's out skateboarding on Devil's Night. Yeah. And it's it's... It's just, it makes you feel filthy watching that. Yep, and then the heroin does. coming out of her yep. arm or whatever the hell it was, it's just disgusting. So anyway, uh, what about one of my favorite characters in this whole movie? We've got to talk about the pawn shop owner, oh, Gideon. Yeah. what did you think of this guy? First of all, the name Gideon, it's like, I think if you think of Gideon Yego from MTV, <laughs> yeah, that's from what I think MTV. of. You're not named Gideon unless you have like a mop top and some thick glasses on. Like that's Especially in the 90s. Gideon, Gideon to me is like a geek looking guy, not some bald, scummy pawn shop owner in Detroit. <laughs> Gideons. <laughs> I just, I feel like personally, <laughs> Gideon Diego, oh my God, that's a deep cut. I, it's Kurt Loader. Kurt I, I just <laughs> Kurt Loder would be reporting on Devil's Night. That's what Kurt he would Loder, be reporting. Kurt Loder on. was so old though compared to those other he people. Was. Like, older looking. Who else? Was, was Sway. Sway was another Sway. one. Caduce. Caduce. <laughs> who was the Who was the redhead girl? Uh, oh, <laughs> did, did you know that Kurt Loder is seventy eight right now? Does that make I you know, feel? I know he was in his forties when we were watching him. Like, what's he doing? <laughs> Gideon Diego is like twenty two, and Kurt Loder. <laughs> Oh, Freaking Caduce is probably 25, and there's Kurt Loader, 43. I forgot some of the other people, yeah, but whatever. Does, does it make you think? So, I don't know if this is a, this is another aside here, and I know we're going way over, but are pawn shops, <laughs> are pawn shops inherently scummy? Yeah, I think they are. And, and if anyone out there is listening, if you own a pawn shop and you want to, uh, please tell us like right, the real it. world of pawn shopping, then please, please hit us up. But, I don't watch Pawn Stars, by the way, so I don't know about yeah, that. Yeah, so like in movies and TV shows, pawn shops are like, oh, this is the place where you pawn your wedding ring or your wedding dress. Two things that were like shattered dreams of a life yeah. that could have been. Let's just, pull, let's, I'll, I'll give you a couple dollars for your for your uh, unhappy life. <laughs> or you right? buy a murder weapon there. Yeah, or you can buy a, a, a weapon to where you know that person is using it for a very specific reason. Yeah, how, or how they just for, used yeah, it yeah. for one. How, how much for that sword up there, sir? Like, what are you going to do with that sword? I don't know. You're going to hang it behind your couch. Going to hang it behind my couch or am I going to sword somebody with it? You know, <laughs> it just seems like a lot of accessory to murder going on at pawn shops, isn't it? And, and the jewelry, man, it's like, cause somebody, look, again, I don't know the world of pawn shops, but it just seems like you need fast cash and yeah. you need to go trade it. You're, you're down on your luck or you 
you know, maybe a junkie's trying to buy drugs or somebody's trying to go buy a shotgun. I don't know. What yeah. the hell? It's weird. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. I, I don't know if Gideon works for him. I got the impression that he's at least like cozy with the dude and maybe he's skimming some off the top, but we got to talk about Top Dollar. First off, mm-hmm. amazing name. We'll villain scale him after we go through some of this stuff, but he is the big bad of this movie and he's got a gang. F- well, I don't know if it's his gang. It's more T-Bird's gang. And we can talk about all these guys in a second, yeah. but he, I, the thing I like about Top Dollar is that he basically claims that he invented Devil's Night, which I think yeah. is, is, I think that's, you know, you talk about accomplishments, put that yeah. on your resume. Put I that on your resume, of your, your, your villain resume. It's your LinkedIn. Yeah. Is, there a, is there a LinkedIn for, for, yeah. for villains? <laughs> so I guess it's the villains wiki. Uh, but let's talk about the gang. Do you feel like they should have had a name? Because they didn't have one. Like, yeah, they should have. Because they had, they had like a, a chant, right? Yeah. They Fire had a celebration. It Fire, Fire it up. It up. <laughs> yeah, they should have had a name. You're right. I liked that the, you're introduced yeah. to them when they're roughing yeah. up an arcade, and, which was like frustrating. And I don't think they're top dollars gang. I feel like they're on his payroll, but it's like they're they're too lower level to be like fully associated with. They're top like a dollar. subcontractor. Yeah, they're they're like his dogs, right? That yeah. he would, that he could sick on people. Yeah. Like he th- he thinks of them as dogs. He subcontracts basically. out this yeah. job. He's, he's yeah. <laughs> they're henchmen. Don't get me wrong. They're henchmen, but they're they're not. You know. They're not on the level of Tony Todd, right? They're, no, they no, are no. clearly dogs compared to an actual right hand man situation. Yeah, you're right. Grange is more so. Grange, played by Tony Todd, is more an employee of Top Dollar. Yes, I guess. yes. He, he is an employee. Yeah, he's an employee, him. and and that gang is are like subcontractors. Correct. Yeah, they they don't they don't really report into him. Yeah, they just and they don't answer yeah. to him. They have to answer to him because he's the boss of the city. Yeah, but, they should be. They should fear him. Yes, yeah. that's true. That's true. Yeah. So the leader of the gang, and they all have great names, by the way. I mean, this is like, this might be all-time henchman list. Like, I don't know how you're not going to get a five on this. And they all have like a different gimmick too. Yeah. The first guy is is T-Bird. I don't know. We can talk about how they die too. And I don't know if it's better to maybe do it in the order in which they die. Yeah, but but can, before we get into the individuality of them, can I can I ask you about the, the health ramifications of swallowing bullets? Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's like- uh, not to get too graphic. They were doing like, shots. Yeah, they were doing shots, and they were swallowing bullets, right? Live, live rounds. Like, not to get too graphic, but come, like, think about like you know, you go to the bathroom at the end of the night. Like, if it's explosive enough, do you get, do you get like a <laughs> pew? <laughs> Does it's it like, shoot out the hole? Or when they spit, when, when they spit into like a, like a thing? <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it what could. If, or, or what if they drink too much tequila that you night mix and they it with start the to vomit? Thing. Blah, pew! Have some fireball. It's a little yeah. spicy. It's hot. It's like a, it's like a Dorian Gray <laughs> mask thing going on when he's shooting out the Tommy gun yeah. out of his mouth. Yeah. What? Which maybe before we go into the guys, also I agree with you. Which is that's another thing. Again, and talk about grimy and feeling disgusting. Yeah. Swallowing ammunition. Is Sucks. disgusting. Yeah. It's it's just that bar like, and the whole place yeah. was filthy. Like, why do I think you would die from that? Like, I feel you like should. They could rip your able, insides yeah. out. Yeah. <laughs> Which is your favorite guy of all of them? If you had to pick one, uh, I'm a big fan of Tin Tin. Yeah, personally. Me too. Unfortunately, he died too soon. Rest in peace. He should have. He should have lasted longer because he had yeah. the knives. Yeah, I like Tin Tin. That was that was my favorite guy. I liked Tintin the best, and I felt yeah. like he should have been more formidable. But I, 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 he got bitched out early. I hated Skank. I, I wanted Skank, Skank to just go away. Friggin' Skank. Skank was the dude that just felt like he was unhinged and constantly high and tweaking. Yeah, and I felt like he. I hated him. He isn't he the guy that actually kills Eric? I'm pretty sure. No, I mean I think Funboy shoots him, but yeah. then Skank pushes him out Skank the window. Skank pushes him out the window. Yeah. So ultimately he kills him out mm. there, but T-Bird was the leader and he's the guy that starts the fire it up chant and he gets yeah. killed because he gets strapped to his own car and blown up, which is like one of the most badass mm. death scenes in the, in the, in the movie, I think. Yeah. yeah. And then Skank, I hated him. Tintin was awesome. I liked him. Yeah. And the way that Draven like toyed with him, which I thought was pretty awesome. And they mm. got into that showdown in the alley and then he lit the crow on, uh, or he put the blood on the on the on the side of the building, mm-hmm. which was amazing in the shape of the crow, which was so cool. But what about Funboy? Like, 
I, I just felt disgusting seeing this guy. Yeah, Maybe it's a heroin gross. thing. I liked Fun Boy's whole vibe, you know, shooting him in the hand, laughing it up, really seeing. There's a guy that just broke into his apartment with a crow, and the guy still see, seeing him as no threat, right? He's like, he's like, hey, man, what are you doing here? I think I you should leave was, now. He was high off his ass, too, which, yeah, was, right. which was also, but it's like, it was yeah. accurate, I feel. Then he shot him in the leg, and then his, his biggest concern was, hey, man, my sheets. <laughs> That place was disgusting as it was. He was worried about his sheets. I yeah. liked it. So what's worse, like a, a filthy bedroom or a filthy bathroom? Like that bathroom reminded me of freaking Saw. Oh, it's tough. I would, I would rather, I'd rather sleep and clean and bathe in dirt. <laughs> like a than, dirty than, tub. And then, and then the opposite, <laughs> right? Does that make sense? You have soap you, as a barrier. Yeah, because you can get clean in the dirty shower. <laughs> But if you're sleeping in filth and that leads to like bugs and stuff, that's <laughs> gross. I can't do that. Like that place had bed bugs for sure. Yeah. Like imagine going to a filthy hotel and then you go in there and it's like the bathroom, the, the tub just looks like they, you know, yeah. disintegrated a dead body in it and yeah. stuff like that. You could, you could like, you could not shower in your own place and like find a cleaner shower on the yeah. street somewhere like YMCA, uh, yeah. any kind of gym Planet you know, you fitness. Just, you know, I don't know. Like you could find a way to find a, a, a nicer shower than your own, but where you go to lay your head is where you go to lay your head. No, yeah, you, you got to be clean. Sleep on the street. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, he and then he got OD'd with his own syringes, which Draven just shoved into his chest. And you mentioned mm-hmm. it, but I liked that the scene where he shot him in the hand and he he showed it healing up, and yeah. I liked that because it scared the guy. A little bit, but he also was, you know, like you said, he was so high. It was crazy. What about Micah? So this is played by Bai Ling, and it's his half-sister. So she's not really, again, so maybe we, we talk about the gang. Then you got Micah, who is his lover slash half-sister. You got Grange, who his main man that we'll come back to in a second. And then you had the pawn shop, which is an associate. He's not part of the gang, but... Did you get the relationship between her and him, Mike? Nothing though. They were just lovers. That's all. I didn't really know they were sister. He he Probably said sister. he called. He said he's like she's my sister, mm-hmm. which is weird. And then but like the he could have said, said that like my sister. Like I don't know. The like, wiki that said mean, that could mean sister. That could mean things. Half sister, half half incest. You know, yeah. incestuous sex. <laughs> half incestuous. You know. Um, she shot Winston, man. Yeah, I she don't did. like her. I don't, I don't like, like her that either. She shot Winston right away. Like he came to help and he shot her right away. She shot him she, right away. She was hurting the bird too, which I didn't like. Yeah, yeah I don't like that either. Bad, I don't like that either. Bad character. So what do you think about her her vibe about the macabre, right? She's into like rituals. Yeah. She seemed like maybe she's the one getting him into it, right? That's what I wasn't sure hey, about. man, this is what you got to do. You got to burn that eyeball and breathe <laughs> up the eye smoke, man. The, <laughs> the eye smoke. You get such good powers from that, man. Like it's gross. <laughs> it's disgusting. <laughs> Again, another you, reason man, why this movie is filthy. Different strokes, man. What if eyeballs are delicious, man? You don't it smells like that. perfume. It's, you'll you'll, you'll be able that. to tell the future, yeah. and now you have all the power. You ever smell a popped eyeball, man? It smells <laughs> like flowers. You don't even know. It's disgusting. Yeah. <laughs> so gross. And the crow rips her eyes out, rightfully so. Rightfully but it's like so. everything that happened to the guys was sort of like what happened to him. So yeah. th- I thought that was fitting. And then you had Tony Todd playing his right-hand man, which I didn't think he was used enough. Grange no, was, they, no. yeah, he had a good snipe shot on the on the on the raven, the crow. But like, yeah, if you have your shot at the crow, you got to kill it. Yeah, you got to kill it. He he wounded the bird. Come on, man. Do you think it has like little armor? Like, is it if so? If it's a supernatural bird, or is this I, it, bird resurrecting should, other people? Well, it should be able to withstand more than one shot. It has it, higher it, HP. It, it has higher HP. It it's HP is higher. That, that's a level ninety nine bird you shoot right there, buddy. <laughs> That bird's been around a long time. Yeah. yeah. How many people has he resurrected? Yeah. It's going to take more than one turn to shoot that bird down. You, you said it was a raven. It literally was a raven, by the way. Yeah. They used ravens yeah. instead of crows because crows are smaller. So ravens are. Yeah. Are so I thought it looked like a raven. It yeah, is. So. And the beak is different. So yeah. that's, it was literally a raven. Oh, the uh, raven bird can't trust him. Don't like him. No. Hate him. And then I don't know. We got to talk about how he dies and let's just maybe we put him through the villain scale. But we talk about Gideon. Gideon died because Top Dollar sliced his throat and then got impatient by how long it was taking for him to die. So we shot him. Which, sliced his throat via sword, Drew. Yeah. How many people in the history of the world have been both stabbed with a sword and shot at the same time? And drawn and quartered. <laughs> probably 
one and it's this guy. It's a- you're either Gideon. getting stabbed with a sword or you're getting shot. You're not getting both. That's Gideon poor Diego. Guy. This poor guy. Gideon I, Diego. I guess, you know, one. if you, would you, ra- but if you're bleeding out in your throat, like just end me, like it's over, just shoot yeah. me. Yeah, at sure. that point, maybe it but was it's a mercy like kill. The the absurdity of like the the ancient you know art of, of <laughs> samurai <absurd>. sword. Then <laughs> 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 just getting shot with just this this, this <sighs> barbaric weapon of a, of a of a gun. Yeah, you know? it was awesome. Yeah, it's this this exquisite weaponry that could it, be it was. That, could, that some may consider a piece of art. It's in a museum. Like his and, stuff. Then, and this guy's like not good enough. <laughs> Let me shoot yeah, this guy. Exactly. The, it's in a museum. The, du- the duality of man, Drew. And then Tony Todd was shot by by Winston. So that was <laughs> let's let's talk about Top Dollar. Let's put him in the villain scale. And yeah. I got a lot to say about this dude. Okay. So if you guys are new right. to our show, we have a villain scale. There's four categories. They're one to five. We're gonna put Top Dollar through it. And we can talk a little bit more about him as a as a villain in general in this, but we have four categories: looker style, hide our layer, plan, and henchman. And again, total out of 20. What do you? What about? Because he's so unique in look and style, man. I have so much to say here. Um, please, you you always make me go first with look and style. Can I give a five? I want you to go first and tell I, me what you want. I need to give a five, and and All I'm right. gonna make the case for it. Okay, so yes. I don't know how you're feeling out the gates. We don't really give out fives on liquor style. I think the only one was Rachel Phelps and like Benjamin from Wayne's maybe World. Tony Silver, maybe. And T1000, I think. Yeah. Terry Silver, I think we give a five. But five is not very easily handed out. But let yeah. me say this. Guy's got amazing suits. The yeah. suits are on point. And you can actually buy, well, you could have bought this suit. Again, a throwback to the Golden Closet. Like this suit that he has, I don't even yeah. know what this thing is. It looks I, like three musketeers. It looks like a kind of thing a vampire would wear. It, what, what? I mean, it's like, imagine if you bought that suit and you just decide to wear it. Like you're going to wear that to a wedding. Like, yeah, I'm going to yeah. wear top dollars, three piece suit to, to my cousin's wedding. You know, it's know. like, it looks like formal get, attire. I feel you get married in that suit because yeah. you love the movie, The Crow. <laughs> like it's, that's the only it's, reason to wear it. It's like a hot topic kind yeah. of thing. It's like they sell a replica. <laughs> but he has this badass vest. He wears freaking leather gloves. Yeah. And and he has this long hair. Yeah. It's I mean, and it, the guy's played by Michael Wincott, who he's in a bunch of stuff. I mean, he's a very good actor. And I think he just he nails the part. He has this long, flowing hair. And dude, he, he has like a weapons cache. Like you talk about Child's Play 3 with the guns. This guy's yeah. got like a thing hanging on the wall with any kind of blade that you could imagine. He's got yeah. freaking Bushido. He's a, bl- yeah. He's a bladesman. Ninja sword. And he carries it on yeah. his back too. Yeah. That's the other thing about it. It has to be a five. It has to. So the only, I agree with you. It's going to be a five, but. <laughs> it has to be. Having not had a lot of experience with this movie in the past, I see this movie now in 2024 and I see this guy as James Franco as Tommy Wazoo, <laughs> in the disaster artist. It That's is. all I could see is Dave it Franco, is. or it James is. Franco. He looked like James Franco to he me. He does. He does. You're right. He does. I, I can't, I can't not, unsee that. It's not taking the five away. I like the five. I'm, he I'm played a Adrian Cross in 24 Live Another Day, by yeah, the way. Did. Looks Similar. like a completely different person. I, I think he looks amazing, and I think no. his style is like off the charts. I'd give him a yeah. six if I could. He's one of the best, right. yeah. best he's, style villains. He's very much like a video game, over the top, like I'm thinking like Streets of Rage style. Yes. Like badass looking villain. When like definitely, talking, comic book, definitely comic book villain. When you're talking about the final boss of a movie, like you got, you got to make this guy look like this. Right. Yeah. And, and you talk about M. Bison. This guy's like M. Bison worthy, in my opinion, the way he looks. And I don't, you can't, I don't know if these are accessories. We talk about accessories and things, but do the eyeballs count as his accessories? Like, is that part of his plan? Like, he's got the cauldron uh, and all that oh, other stuff. Only if he was wearing them. Okay. That's true. <laughs> like around a necklace. Well, not, like on a necklace. Yeah. <laughs> like Dolph Lundgren and uh, what is it? The guy wears the ears in I yeah. think, Universal Soldier. <laughs> that's it. Yeah. That's an um, accessory. What about his hideout and his lair? Do you want me to go first? I don't know. I don't know. Like, what did we see? Did we really just see the boardroom? Like, what do we see? Like, so he's got a nightclub. He's yeah. got the whole nightclub. Is you it could, the pit? It, it is. It's and the piece. Of, the, 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 the place sucks, though. Oh, no, that's not the pit. No, the pit is a bar. The pit's the bar, but it's beneath the place. So, the, but it's a nightclub. 
And, and then he has a room a, that has like a boardroom. Yes, it's on okay. the top, and he lives at that place. And he's so got the on. bedroom there. Let, 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 uh, I'm confused now. So there's a there's a bar and yes. a nightclub and it's all together. His, his offices, from what I understand. All right, yes. that's, that's pretty good. It's pretty, yeah. I'm, not, I'm, I'm, <laughs> pretty I'm good. impressed. I'm impressed. And he's got the city. If you think about it, he owns I, the city. Yeah, I thought they were like different places. If that's now, all one place, I mean, like I'm thinking maybe five two. I don't know. Now does this he could own be, Air we could be in trouble department? Here. <laughs> we could be in trouble here, Drew. I know, right? But th- it's, see, you uh, always say this, right? The scale yeah. balances scale itself. The scale finds a way. The scale finds so a way. The scale finds a way. Yeah. Uh, unless you're Terry Silver. Yeah. But we'll see when we get there. We got Plan and Henchman still to go. But the place is pretty badass. And you could argue he owns Detroit too. And does he own Eric Draven's apartment too now? He, I mean, yeah, he doesn't own Detroit. Drew. Stop it. He, he, I feel like he owns Detroit for one night a year. That's how October yeah. 30th. It's Devil's Night that he invented. <laughs> um, does that count allegedly. as an accessory? Yeah. Yeah, Devil's that's, Night. That's like uh, I just watched Austin Powers for the first time in a long time the other day, and it's, it's absurd. Like the way uh, Austin, the way Doctor Evil says his father invented the question mark. It's like that's the same thing to me. Oh, I invented Devil's Night. Yeah, he did. He started Stop the first it. fire. Get it out of here. He started um, the first fire in yeah. a trash can. Yeah. No. Um. I don't know, man. It's the the multifaceted. You got the scumbag bar. You have a a, a ball and nightclub. You have a nice looking boardroom for all your villains to meet, right? Yeah. Three to four. I'm, I'm a leaning four. Are you, where are, you, are you with me with that? I'm, are I'm you going, going down to three? I'm thinking four because it can't be a five because Eric Draven gets in too easily and then yeah. he just jumps out the window. Well, he's the crow. So. His security was bad, I would say. Yeah. So, But, but he's that, supernatural. The, he's supernatural. He is. He is. He's kind of like Batman. He just swoops in there. Yeah. I think a four because of all the multifaceted, because he's also making money off that place too. Yeah. So he owns that place. I, I kind of want to go four, but I can be convinced on a three. I'll go to four. Four was okay. my initial. Let's do four. So, I mean, he's this guy's he's got nine so far. Now, as you say, the, the, scale, plan, finds a way. the scale finds a way. The scale finds now, a way. Now, plan. Now, you, you go first on this one. You got you to gotta break it down for people because I don't really know what you'd consider his plan. That's why I think he's not going to get a good score because I don't think he has a plan. Like, what's his plan to like... You're Run telling Detroit. me he like at the end of the movie he had like he wants to run Detroit, which is very that's a very broad plan. He's OCP. <laughs> yeah. But at the end he wants to like have Draven's powers that he I mean, thinks he's gonna gather he's thinking from the big. eyeballs or something. Bold. That just seems silly. Now that's <laughs> the type of plan that a lunatic villain would have. Right? <laughs> it just might work. <laughs> but it's not gonna get you a good score on the scale, though. I agree with you. I can't give him a good plan because his plan is basically to just have Devil's Night and take over the city. Like, it doesn't... Yeah. And he just kills people recklessly. Like, there wasn't really a plan. I can't say yeah. one because it's bold enough that he's successful to have, I don't know, the founding fathers of the Devil's Night crime families yeah. in his yeah. in his, in his uh, boardroom. And guess what? They're all, they're all dead now. They are all dead. <laughs> they're all dead now. <laughs> the crow killed them all. <laughs> It was like a Matrix style so, shootout. So he's got to start from scratch if he survived. If he survived the yeah. movie, he'd have to start from scratch. It'd just be him setting those fires. <laughs> so wait, and maybe he wanted it to happen. See, mm-hmm. that's what I wanted to happen because now mm-hmm. he owns their territory too. Oh, no competition. Yeah. But the he's, other question I have for you, and I know it's an aside. So they said originally, like he can only go after people that wronged him. Was the crow allowed to kill all those people? Yeah, man. Because they were shooting at him. It's like freaking predator rules, right? He, he, he provoked them. Yeah, he provoked them. They, they were they were formidable opponents with weapons. <laughs> yeah. So he, he was allowed to, to attack them. The scale, the kill skeleton cowboy yeah. is not coming back. Yeah. Skull cowboy or whatever. You know, like um, you know, like when the T one thousand gets shot a hundred times in a row, yeah. like it slows them down big time. Yeah, and it takes a little bit longer for the bullets to get sucked out. Right. I mean, if the crow was just going to sit there and take hundreds of rounds from all those guys and not retaliate, he's going to be down. Like disintegrate. And then he'll, yeah, and then he'll be down. And then at that point, maybe they could chop his head off or something. And then, <laughs> then what, right? Yeah, does his head get reattached like, an, so, like a, right. a T-1000? Probably not. So he has to defend himself or else that, that situation could happen. Man, we should have talked about that earlier when we were talking about like, what would it take if he's invincible? Does his head reattach? Yeah. Like, does, like, what, what if he got shot do? in the face? Yeah, what if he... What if he got stabbed in the eyeball and the eyeball popped? Does the eyeball unpop? I think the eyeball goes back based on like the bullet wounds heal. But if you dismembered yeah. somebody, does that 
does he put his arm? I mean, on it would be it weird if it would be weird if a new arm grew in there. It's like a like a <laughs> lizard or something. I don't know. <laughs> maybe maybe he just has to like put it and like attach it himself, attach it, and then it and like then the cells fuses. the cells fuse together. Yeah, 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 yeah. Why didn't we talk about this earlier? Can he, See, I'm can sorry, he people. burn? Can he burn? I guess if you burn him away, maybe he can. Yeah. I don't know. Isn't that the oh, title track? Burn. Burn. <laughs> Every night I burn. <laughs> It's like a the two. The, the plan's the a two. Yeah, that's a, the, it's a two. It's got to be a yeah. two. I don't know. It's not successful either. I give him yeah. bold, bold, pow, bold uh, vision, yeah. but just not great. All right, now henchmen. Again, the scale balances itself. I yeah. think these guys are pretty strong. I mean, they get killed by a supernatural being. They did okay. a lot of damage yeah. here. Yeah, and and the henchmen. We don't always scale them by how effective they are because henchmen are there to be killed, right? Correct. So they're, they're, not, they're not supposed to be world beaters. No. But we what we want them to be is have their own personalities. And they certainly have that in this movie. Oh, hell yeah. They s- definitely succeeded. Like yeah. I said, every guy's got a gimmick. You got the knife yeah. guy. You got the car guy. You got the, yep. the fire guy. You got yep. all these dudes that are doing yep. things. I don't care if the hero takes you out so easy, and so quick. If you have a personality, you count as a viable henchman in a movie. And I'm leaning between four and five, Drew. I, know, I don't dude. know. I don't know. Do you do you want me to tell you other ones so you, we can gauge them? Because I can tell you, like, I was thinking about Takahashi from Johnny Mnemonic. That was a four. We yeah. had Al from Angels in the Outfield because he had all the angels at yep. a four. Yep. Uh, Patravita from Raw Deal had a five. Yeah. Oh, hell yeah, he did. It, it, it's, it's a great henchman. Uh, so here, here's the closest that I could give you. So you made, you made this comparison earlier. This is a, a filthy scumbag, scum bucket, <laughs> like like just trashy, filth, like s- disgusting diehard. Hans Gruber. Yeah. Like Hans Gruber had a four and he had, yeah. you know, 50 henchmen. Yeah, they yeah, all yeah. had a gimmick and they all had different things. I feel like we got to go a four here at least. I, I don't I don't think these henchmen are better than Hans Gruber's henchmen. They're not, henchmen. but they're so, not professionals. But they're, but they're equal. So I'm going to give him a four. I'm, yeah. not, I'm not giving him a five. I'm the same. I, I want to go a four that, because... That cleared my eyes for yeah. the clear four. Shang yeah. Song had a five because, I mean, you got Scorpions. Yeah, but please, of or, course. Uh, Sub-Zero. Of course. So yeah. it's like you're not going to... And Fushan you, from Hard Target because you had freaking... Yeah. What's his name? Arnold Vosloo. Yeah. The the greatest right-hand man of all time. <laughs> Van, Van At Van least the most, the most underrated. <laughs> But what, you, but what are you going to have Sub Zero and not have a five for no, him? You, you can't. What are you nuts at Sub Zero? So, man, let me tell you. Okay, let me add this up. So if you it's go four. back, it's a four. It's a four. Oh yeah. Okay. So it's a four. All right. Let me let me just correct this because I put a five by accident. So if you add this up, you get a five for look and style. You get a four for hideout and layer. You get a two for henchman or two for plan and a four for henchman. It's a good score. You're looking at a fifteen, man. That's. Yeah. I mean, look. We didn't even talk about it yet, and I just want to touch on it before we end because we got to end here in a minute. But the final fight on the roof in the rain. Yes. He takes his freaking sword out, and Eric Draven's fighting in a storm. Yep. And he pulls like the, what is it, the freaking cross out? Can't Can't rain rain all the time. Well, it rained all the time in the movie. But (laughs) he pulled the cross out of the church, and he starts using it as a sword? Okay. Since when did this musician become an expert in sword fighting? Since a crow brought him back from the dead. Yeah. But <laughs> Does he channel all the previous crow's powers? I hope so. Like I mean, from that, medieval I mean, times and yeah, stuff? Yeah, I mean, that would be nice. That would be nice. And I'd buy that too. I would buy that. <laughs> Why um, didn't we talk about this earlier? Yeah. But my, my concern with the final fight is the girl, this girl, Drew, gets herself on the roof and is falling. Yeah. And as this crow is fighting for his life, she's screaming, Eric, like, like he's yeah. gonna stop fighting a sword fight to help her not fall. Sorry, girl, you gotta go. Selfish of her to yell his name and distract him while he's sword fighting, dude. I swear, this is an iconic fight to me. I mean, I again, I know that you yeah. didn't grow up watching this movie as much no, as I great. did, but it's great. Great, it is fight. awesome. And when you talk about the way this movie was made, it, it was really well done. I mean, especially yeah. for all the yeah. trouble that we and had, but it's iconic. It's just, so, so many of these movies, the like where the main bad guy doesn't do a lot of the violence, right? Is kind yeah. of like talking orders. He's, he's a suit in a boardroom, right? Pulling the strings. Yeah, this made the final boss formidable. It made it a great fight. And I love that they did it. I love Top Dollar. And I think of all the movies that we've done, he's one of my favorite villains that we've done. With a 15 out of 20, I mean, he's yeah. up there with all the other ones. 
So I don't know. I love this movie, man. I I, I really yep. like this movie a lot. Have you seen any of the other ones? Have you ever mm. seen any others? No, never. Me either. And and you got City of Angels in '96. This TV show with Mark Daskakos. I, I'm saying that right, right? Daskakos. It's the uh, martial sure. arts guy from Stairway sure. to Crow Stairway to Heaven in '98. It was a TV show, and then there was the Crow Salvation, and then get this, man. 2006, they made a movie called The Crow Wicked Prayer. Sorry, Tara Reid, David Boreanaz, Edward Furlong as the crow. I'm pretty sure. Okay, okay. Emmanuel Shiki, uh, Sloan. Sloan. Danny Trejo, Dennis Hopper, <laughs> and Tito Ortiz. Apparently, yeah. I've I, not seen this. This is a movie, this is a cast from the 90s being made in a 2006 movie, Drew. It's... In like, what world are you casting Edward Furlong in 2006, Drew? If you no, no disrespect to John Connor. If I could just show you the picture of him too, by the yeah. way, if you look at him, it, yeah. <laughs> just I'm just gonna I'll send you the like, link. You look at it later. Yeah. But like, why Google is it why is it Ryder strong in this movie, Drew? It, it should have been him. <laughs> it's it, he looks. I don't even. He looks like he has the haircut of Misty from Cyberpunk. Yeah. If you know who I'm yeah. talking about, J- uh, yeah. Jackie's girlfriend. Oh yeah, it's that hair. It's ridiculous. So <laughs> I don't know. And then and then by the way, we have the upcoming remake coming out. Now I know we yeah. did our remakes of remakes and we remade that three times. Sure, I will sure. ask you simply. Sure, sure. Yeah. Are you okay with them re- remaking this movie? Yeah, thirty years. Boom. Thirty. Thirty years. years it's your yep. thing. Mm-hmm. I think I would say that I've seen people come out and say this. I think even Ernie Hudson say it. They didn't want to remake it because they didn't want to like mess with the legacy of of Brandon Lee. And I think the one thing I would say to that is just don't call him Eric Draven. You made five other Crow movies. Sure. Just make yeah. him somebody else. The Crow, so, let the Crow resurrect some other guy. Sure. I think when when you see it and you see the trailer, again, it's not out yet at the time of the, doing this. He looks like the guy Ninja from D'Antward or whatever it's called. I love that guy. Bill Scars. <laughs> yeah. has that like weird, dirty yeah. filth mullet. And he's yeah. got the damaged Joker yeah. tattoos from Jared Leto. And I think so, that's what people are yeah. sort of turned off by. So I don't know. We'll see. We'll to see me, if it's any good. To me, it looks like dirty, sexy John Wick. It, it, it does. It, was, it, was, it does. And uh, somebody who somebody made the joke, I forget who, somebody, didn't somebody make the joke, this is, this is the movie that uh, yes, <laughs> Megan Fox. This and, is the, the Megan Fox and machine, machine gun, gun, gun Kelly bang too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> New crow. It does. It, does. Yeah. it looks. Exactly I forget who like, said it, but it's exactly someone on what Twitter. I, like. I think yeah. It, yeah. it really does. I mean, look, I'll watch it. I like Bill Skarsgård, but I could understand people saying, "Hey, don't don't remake it. You don't need to remake it, but just make another one." I think it's fine. Yeah. And originally, yeah. Jason Momoa was attached to it. I think in 2018, and then he left the project. So we'll see if it's any good. I don't know. I'm not like saying it's blasphemy. I'll I'll watch it. 30 years. Enough time's gone by. <laughs> it's enough time. But if it's the 30th anniversary of of his death, maybe it's maybe you need to wait one it's more. It's always going to be the en- Never mind. What about the 31st anniversary? Then it's not a, that's not a real anniversary. Not a, <laughs> so, anyway, all right, I don't know. I don't know what you guys think of this movie. It's a classic to me. I love it. Check check it out if you haven't seen it definitely it's worth the watch send us an email the last row podcast at gmail.com let us know your thoughts leave us a comments on the episodes page the last row podcast.com send us a tweet or whatever it's called on x these days at the last row pod instagram wherever you guys follow us we'll be back in, in two weeks on thursday april 11th and if you're enjoying the show please consider leaving us a five-star review on apple Podcasts and spotify on that note see you guys in two weeks yeah. <laughs> Can we just play the solo right now? Should I? We're gonna get copyright strike. Is it worth it? Might be worth it.